The way the world is today, Adnodia said, shaking his head. I don't know what is going to happen. From that it was clear that Adnodia had been hearing news over the wireless again that made him fear for the future of the country. We did not exactly sit up then. There was never any change, even in the kind of news he would bring us. Every time it was about stone throwings in Johannesburg locations, and about how many new kinds of bombs the Russians had got, and about how many people had gone to jail for telling the Russians about still other kinds of bombs they could make, although it did not look as though the Russians needed to be educated much in that line. And we could never really understand why Adnodia listened at all. We hardly ever listened to him, for that matter. We would rather hear from Geisbert von Ton if it was true that the Odeling at Pillensburg really forgot himself in the way that Yuri Stein's wife had heard about from Kral Matoza at the kitchen door. The Matoza had come to buy happy stamps to stick on his forehead for the early Nlolo dance. Now there was news for you. About the Odeling, I mean. And even to hear that the Nlolo dance was being held soon again was at least something. And if it should turn out that what was being said about the Pillensburg Odeling was not true, well... Then the same thing applied to a lot of what Adnodia heard over the wireless also. I don't know what is going to happen, Adnodia repeated. The way the world is today, I just heard over the wireless. That's how the news we got in the old days was better, Opa Becker said. I mean in the real old days, when there was no wireless, and there was not the telegraph either. The news you got then, you could do something with. And you didn't have to go to the post office and get it from a newspaper. The post office is the curse of the Transvaal. Yuri Stein said that Opa Becker was quite right there. He himself would have never taken on the job of postmaster at Ruggefle if he had as much as guessed that there were four separate forms that he would have to fill in, each of them different, for a simple five shilling money order. It would be so much brainier and neater, Yuri Stein said, for people who wanted to send five shillings somewhere if they would just wrap up a couple of half crowns in a thick wad of brown paper and then post them in the ordinary way, like a letter. That was what the new red pillar box in front of his door was for, Yuri Stein explained. The authorities had gone to the expense of that new pillar box in order to help the public, and yet you still found people coming in for postal orders and money orders. The other day, a man even came in and asked could he telegraph some money somewhere. I gave that man a piece of brown paper and showed him the pillar box, Yuri Stein said. It seemed until then that he did not know what kind of progress we had been making here. I therefore asked him if I could show him some more ways in regard to how advanced the Groot Mariko was getting. But he said no, the indications I'd already given him were plenty. Yuri Stein said that he thought it was handsome of the man to have spoken up for the Mariko like that, seeing that he was quite a newcomer to these parts. Because we never knew how long Yuri Stein would be when once he got on the subject of his work, we were glad when Johnny Kuhn asked Opa Becker to explain some more to us about how they got news in the old days. We were all pleased, that is, except Adno Deer, who had again tried to get in a remark, but had got no further than to say that if we knew something, we would all shiver in our feldskins. How did we get news? Opa Becker said, replying to another question of Johnny Kuhn's. Well, you would be standing in the land, say. And then one of the Betwanas would point to a small cloud of dust in the port, and you would walk across to the big tree by the dam, where the road bends. And the traveller would come past there with two force horses in front of his cape cart and he would get off from the cart, and shake hands, and say he was duplicy, and you would say, you were Becker, and he would say afterwards, that he couldn't stay the night on your farm, because he had to get to Chalala's Kup. Well, mm, there was news. You could talk about it for days, for weeks even. You have got no idea how often my wife and I discussed it, and we knew everything that there was to know about the man. We knew his name was Duplessis. 
Atno Deer said then, but he did not think much of that sort of news. People must have been a bit simple in the head in those old times that Opa Becker was talking about if they thought anything of that sort of news. Why? If you compared it with what the radio announcer said only yesterday... Yuri Stain's wife came in from the kitchen at that moment. There was a light of excitement in her eyes, and when she spoke, it was to none of us in particular. It has just occurred to me, Yuri Stain's wife said. That is, if it's true what they're saying about the Pillensburg hodling, of course. Well, it has just struck me that, when he forgot himself in the way they say, provided that he did forget himself like that, mind you. Well, perhaps the odling didn't know that anybody was looking. That was a possibility that had not so far occurred to us, and we discussed it at some length. In between our talk, Atno Deer was blurting out something about the rays from a still newer kind of bomb that would kill you right in the middle of the felt and through 50 feet of concrete. So we said, of course, that the best thing to do would be to keep a pretty safe distance away from concrete, with those sort of rays about, if concrete was as dangerous as all that. We were in no mood for foolishness. On another day, Opa Becker continued, you would again be standing in your land, say, or sitting, even, if there was a long day of ploughing ahead, and you did not want to tie yourself out unnecessarily. You would be sitting on a stone in the shade of a tree, say, and you would think to yourself, how lazy those Bichuanas look, going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, with the plough and the oxen. And you would get quite sleepy, say, thinking to yourself, how lazy those Bichuanas are. If it wasn't for the oxen to keep them going, they wouldn't do any work at all, you might perhaps think. And then, without you in the least expecting it, you would again have news. And the news would find a stone for himself, and come along and sit down right next to you. It would be the new felt cornet, say. And why nobody saw any dust in the port that time was because the felt cornet didn't come along the road. And you would make a joke with him and say, I suppose that's why they call you a felt cornet. Because you don't travel along the road, but you come by the Feltlangers. And the Felt Cornet would laugh and ask you a few questions. And he would tell you that they'd had good rains at Derdepoort. Hmm, well, there was something that I could tell my wife over and over again for weeks. Ah, <sighs> it was news. For weeks I had that to think about. The visit of the felt cornet. In the old days, it was real news. We could see from the way Atno Deer was fidgeting in his chair that he guessed we were just egging the old man on to talk in order to scoff at all the important European news that he, Atno Deer, regularly retailed to us and that we were getting tired of. After a while, Atno Deer could no longer contain himself. This second childhood drivel that Opa Becker is talking, Atno Deer announced, not looking at anybody in particular, but saying it to all of us in the way that Yuri Stain's wife had spoken when she came out of the kitchen. Well, I would actually sooner listen to a scandal about the Pillensburg hodling. There's at least some sort of meaning to it. I'm not being unfriendly to Opa Becker, of course. I know it's just that he's old. But it's also quite clear to me that he doesn't know what news is at all. Yuri Stain said that Opa Becker's news was at least more sensible than a man lying on the felt under 50 feet of concrete because of some rays. If a man were to lie under 50 feet of concrete, he wouldn't be able to breathe, leave alone anything else. On another day, say, Opa Becker would go on. You would not be in your lands at all, but you would be sitting on your front stoop drinking coffee, say. And the cape cart with the two force horses in front would be coming down the road again but in the opposite direction, going towards the poor this time. And you would not see much of Duplessis' face, because his hat would be pulled over his eyes, and the felt cornet would be sitting on the cake cart next to him, say. Opa Becker paused. 
He paused for a while, too, holding a lighted match cupped over his pipe, as though he was out in the felt where there was wind, and puffing vigorously. Hmm. And my wife and I would go on talking about it for years afterwards, Opa Becker went on. For years after Duplessis was hanged, I mean.